And now it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Maureen Ramo, who is the director of the Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory from Columbia University. The G. Unger uh, Vettelson, did I pronounce that right? Vettelson? Close enough. Close enough. <laughs> professor of Earth and Environmental Science. Professor Ramo, <clears throat> Ramo's research focuses on the history and causes of climate change in the past, including understanding the consequences of climate change for sea levels and ice sheet stability. Her research has been profiled in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Atlantic, the New Yorker, US News and World Report, Discovery Magazine, and elsewhere. She has been featured on television via the History Channel, BBC World, BBC World Science, BBC Planet Earth, PBS News, uh, Newsweek, NewsHour, and more. Her weather hypothesis, her uplift weather hypothesis that addresses climate change in geologic timescales was the subject of both a PBS Nova and a BBC Horizon documentary. Professor Ramo has spent many months at sea and in the field studying how the earth works, including and participating in numerous scientific expeditions. She has published over 100 peer-reviewed scientific publications, including 10 in Science and Nature. A fellow of the Natural, uh, National Academy of Science, the American Association for Advancement of Science, the American Geophysical Union, the Geological Society at London, and the Explorers Club. In 2014, she became the first woman, and we're just gonna repeat that, woman, to be awarded the Wollaston Medal, Geolog uh, the Geological Society of London's most senior medal. Previously awarded to many people, but what the name that stood out was previously awarded to Charles Darwin. In 2019, she was awarded the AGU's Maurice Ewig Medal for significant original contribution to the ocean sciences. Today, uh, today her topic is climate change, carbon dioxide, and sea levels. What can I do? So it is my pleasure to introduce and the Federated Conservation, um, Federated Conservation of Westchester County, the co-sponsor, to introduce Maureen Ramo. Thank you. Thank you, Joan. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. I, I basically grew up in an amazing library in the town I grew up in, which was Northeastern Massachusetts. And the public library was um, built by and designed by H.H. H. Richardson, which who was a famous 19th century architect. And uh, it was literally my second home growing up. So I'm always happy to talk to talk at libraries. So I am going to, uh, I'm happy to be here. I'm going to share my screen and just dive right into uh, a story about climate change in earth history. Um, I'll just give a plug before I start for where I work, the Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory. This is a screenshot of it right there in the lower left is Route 9W in Rockland County right near the New Jersey border. It's a satellite campus of Columbia University where uh, we've been there for 72 years. There's about 500 people and, and 200 scientists and 100 students studying all of earth, uh, earth science and climate science. And uh, it's a great place to work. Once a year we have an open house. This year we did it virtually. Um, but we love welcoming people onto the campus and, and, and showing them what we do. So I'm going to talk about climate today. And um, let's see, how do I make my thing go forward? There we go. And uh, the question I want to ask is what can the, ge I'm a geologist at heart, what can the, ge what can the geologic record uh, tell us about the stability of polar ice sheets? And, and I will, you know, make the connections for you uh, why I care about polar ice sheets and, and, and that is because they are intimately related with sea level and the problem of rising seas. And um, another way to ask this question is just to say what is likely to happen as we continue to dump 
carbon dioxide, a clear odorless waste product into the world's atmosphere. And uh, let me be very clear, CO2 is a pollutant. Okay, so it's, it's the waste byproduct of the combustion of oil, gas, coal. Okay, so I'm not, I try not to have a lot of plots in my talks uh, when I'm giving talks to the general public, but there are a few exceptions. This plot right here is probably the most famous set of data um, in the entire field of earth and climate sciences. Back in the late 50s in 1958, Charles Keeling started measuring CO2 systematically in the atmosphere at an observatory in Mauna Loa. And this was the first time continuous measurements of CO2 in the atmosphere were made. And, uh, and I first became aware of this. I look at this curve and I think, I, I see my life. I was born in 1959, whoops, sorry. I was born in 1959. Um, by the late 70s, I was in college. I went to Brown and I was studying Earth's climate history. I, I became aware of this curve. I knew that scientists were concerned that the curve was rising and that this would cause warming if, of the Earth's climate. By the 80s, when I was in graduate school, and certainly by the late 80s, there were some extraordinary warm summers and all the scientists were discussing how clearly Earth's temperature was responding to this rise in CO2. And since then, you can see it's, it's done nothing but continue this long, steady increase. In fact, the rate of increases increased slightly. Superimposed on this really, uh, this curve is this little, um, I don't know, I don't know how to use a um, cursor. I don't think you can see my cursor, but, but you can see there's a little wiggle, you know, up and down, up and down, up and down, superimposed on this long upward trend. And, um, oh wait, maybe this will work. Mouse. We can, can see it. Can you see it now? Yes. Oh, that's terrific, okay. So what this is, is, is this is essentially the Earth's biosphere breathing in and out. And every spring, all the trees in the Northern Hemisphere, mostly in the Northern Hemisphere, leaf out and draw down CO2 because there, there's so much photosynthesis going on. And then every fall, right about now, all the leaves are dropping and then they will rot and let their CO2 and their carbon back into the atmosphere. So if there was no uh, addition of CO2 to the atmosphere from the combustions of fossil fuels, you'd have this kind of straight line going across with this seasonal cycle of the biosphere breathing in and out. So um, one, you know, some people, have, people in the past have said, oh, I don't know how to look at charts. And I, and, but if I just say, think of it as a stock chart, people often go, oh, okay, that's a stock chart. So now what I'm gonna ask you to do is think of this as a stock chart where you're looking at uh, how your stock's done over five years. And all I'm gonna do now is show you the same data, but I'm gonna change the X axis down at the bottom. So instead of looking over uh, about 60 years, we're gonna look over about 10,000 years, okay? So that's what this chart is. So here's today. Here's 10,000 years ago, the beginning of the warm Holocene. And the data, the chart I just showed you is this red line right here. So you can see it went from about uh, in the low 300s up to it's, well, today, this chart's out of date. Today it's 414 parts per million. So right up here where this red arrow is. And so you can see very clearly, and, and again, there's this little this little box on the left, that's a blow up of this interval right here. The last 200, um, uh, the last 200 and, well, a little more than 200 years, 230, 240 years. And, um, and what you can see really clearly is that in the late 19th century, um, you really started seeing the rate of increase of CO2 in the atmosphere go up. And that's like what you were looking at right down here is the beginning of the industrial revolution, the invention of the steam engine and the beginning of coal, oil, gas. And so, um, and so you can see, right? It really dramatically increased the concentration in parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere. Okay, and that, and that, that value continues to go up year by year. So, 
I, I, I'm telling you uh, it's coming from combustion of fossil fuels. I'll give you a little bit of numbers. Uh, so industrial activity accounts for 91%, and this is, this is a budget for the years 2006 to 2015. 91% uh, of the CO2 that entered the atmosphere came from industrial activities and about 10%, 9% came from deforestation. However, luckily for us, it does not all stay in the atmosphere. The regrowth of forests, especially in the Northern hemisphere areas that were deforested hundred years ago for farming, the regrowth of forests absorbs about 31% of what's put in each year. And the oceans absorb about a quarter of what's put in each year. This is not great for the oceans. It makes the oceans more acidic. CO2 is a bit, is, is slightly acidic. You know that from your Coca-Cola. Um, and, um, and only about 44% of the CO2 ends up in the atmosphere. And that is what was measured in the Mauna Loa and many other records since. Okay, so how important is CO2 in controlling Earth's temperature? It's this trace gas in the atmosphere. It's measured in parts per million. Many people have a hard time believing they could really, that this really could be a pollutant that's really uh, has the capability of changing Earth's climate. So let's, let's think about Earth's climate. So, the climate system is incredibly complicated. I know that because I've been working side by side with, with climate modelers for almost 40 years and working continuously to try to build better and more complex models to predict future climate. But in another sense, if you just step back and think about the temperature of the earth, it's a very simple physics problem. And if you think about the earth, it's just a rocky ball uh, at some distance from the sun. And all of the, you know, except for a tiny, tiny, almost insignificant amount of heat that comes from geothermal energy from the Earth's interior, all of the climate and weather at the Earth's surface is driven by heat from the sun. And so if you ever took a physics class in college or high school, you would have had a, a, a week probably studying the Earth's radiation balance. And, um, and, and what I show, and, you know, and you would have probably seen some equations like down there, but we don't really need those equations. Really, you, there's three major variables that control all of like, that control the average temperature of our planet, right? The third planet from the sun. Um, and, uh, and so those three knobs are solar radiation, how much solar radiation hits the top of the planet, top of the atmosphere. The second knob would be the Earth's reflectivity. You can see right here in this photograph, a lot of ice and snow. If that solar radiation is reflected back to space, it's not being used to warm the planet. And then the third knob is greenhouse gases. And greenhouse gases basically let shortwave solar radiation in, but their molecular structure interferes with the outgoing long wave radiation of the planet as the planet heats up and radiates back to space. And so it basically acts as a blanket and it's you know, exactly analogous to on a cold winter night, throwing another down quilt over you and you were just gonna hold more of your heat in under that quilt and it'll be much colder on the other side of that quilt. So that's, that's these are the th three major variables. There's this beautiful, um, website where you can go and play with all these different knobs and see what it does to the planet. So, so, you know, and so in some ways, the mean temperature of the planet is just a function of these three knobs. So let's um, think about- For a second. Yeah. We have a question. Somebody wants to know what percentage is jet fuel contribute? Do you know? Jet, uh, jet fuel. Uh, no, I don't know. Um, travel is typically, if you're a person that travels a couple times a year, that is probably the biggest part of your carbon footprint, your personal carbon footprint. And so, another question is, has it decreased since COVID? Uh, yes. Yep. Um, so, it, so one of the questions that I'm almost always asked is, uh, 
you know, how do we know the difference between man-made climate change and natural climate variability? Why can't this be natural? And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about natural climate variability, which is what I've spent my career studying. Here's what the world looked like 50 million years ago in Antarctica. And you might be thinking, how do you know that? And we know that from fossils. And we know that from plant fossils and animal fossils. And you've probably been to beautiful natural history museums where panoramas are reconstructed from the fossils. There was no ice on Antarctica 50 million years ago. The poles were about 20 degrees warmer. Atmospheric CO2 was at least 800 parts per million and probably much higher. So why was that? We know that on timescales of millions of years, there are two major sources and sinks of, of CO2 to the atmosphere. Volcanism, volcanism driven by the circulation and convection in the Earth's mantle. And that volcanism releases CO2 to the atmosphere. And the removal of CO2 from the atmosphere is driven by rock weathering, the, the CO2 dissolving in rainwater and then reacting with rocks in a chemical reaction called rock weathering. So over millions of years, these two processes can change their relative balance. And in fact, this is what happened in the Eocene. It was a time of much more volcanism and much less rock weathering. So we, we understand the major factors controlling climate change over millions of years. And we know that these, you know, volcanism cannot change dramatically on a time scale as short as a century. It, not only that, if it did, we would certainly be observing that. However, you're probably thinking, but wait, I know that climate has changed on a much smaller time scale too, because I know there was an ice sheet over Westchester County and Rockland County 20,000 years ago. And you would be right. This is what the world looked like 20,000 years ago, Ice Age Earth. My Game of Thrones cartoon is getting a little dated. <laughs> um, but I grew up in Boston and my friend Angel, who is also a Game of Thrones fan, made me this slide. This is the height of the wall in Game of Thrones. And this is the height of the ice sheet over Boston, <laughs> the height of the last ice age. Um, so what's going on there? We, know, we also know volcanism didn't change dramatically or, or weathering didn't change dramatically on this time scale. And in fact, what's going on there is this solar radiation knob. So on over 50 million years, we're turning the greenhouse gas knob. On 20,000 years, we're turning this knob and we're saying why? And it's because the Earth's orbit around the sun isn't perfectly circular. It is, has these subtle perturbations in the tilt of the axis, in the precession of the axis, and in the eccentricity of the orbit. And these perturbations are caused by the gravitational influence of the large outer planets, especially Saturn and Jupiter. And so these little, these, these little subtle variations, which happen on timescales of tens of thousands of years, are always going on and they always cause these little uh, warm cold cycles. Oops, sorry, why is it this? There we go. So I'm gonna show you this little um, video, which is a climate model in a paper I did with a uh, scientist, Ayako Abiyache from Japan. And it's a climate model showing you the ice sheets in the Northern hemisphere waxing and waning over the last 400,000 years. And this is just what happens. This is just what happens when the Earth is orbiting naturally around the sun. Sometimes we're a little bit closer to the sun in the Northern hemisphere. Sometimes we're a little bit further from the sun in the Northern hemisphere. And that subtle difference measured in percentage uh, of solar radiation received is enough to send us from an ice age into a warm period back into an ice age. So coming back to, uh, let me see if I can, coming back to the CO2, what's going on right now? Well, I, I showed you the measurements of CO2. I told you that it was significant um, knob in controlling global climate. So you might say, okay, well, we should be seeing a significant global warming. You've heard it's happening. Now I'm gonna show you the data 
people love measuring things and they've been measuring thing the earth's surface temperature with thermometers for quite really since they were invented and since the late 19th century there's been a quite a robust global network of thermometers this is a nasa visualization of what global surface temperatures have done over the last 140 years and what you're looking at is the difference from the mid 20th century average temperature which is about then and so this is data it's obviously interpolated across areas where there weren't thermometers and and here's today and you can see that the high latitudes in the northern hemisphere especially are up to four degrees fahrenheit warmer uh, than the mid-century average temperature in those places. I can do that again. Would you like to see that again? So this is 19th, late 19th century, much colder than the mid-century average. So this is global warming. When you hear people say global temperatures have risen by an average of one degree Fahrenheit over the last 120 years, this is the data to which they are referring. And, you know, it's an important takeaway is that, you know, the Earth's surface is highly variable. I mean, even today, there's a place in the North Atlantic that's cooler than average, right? And there's places around the world that are cooler than average. But on the whole, the Earth is warming. Okay, so people say, well, maybe it could be the sun. Is there more solar radiation? Since the late 70s, satellites have been measuring the total solar irradiance, the amount of heat, the amount of radiation given off by the sun. Every single one of these uh, acronyms on the left refers to a different satellite mission that was measuring the total solar um, output. And you can see here's the 11 year sunspot cycle that's associated with a very small change in solar output. And you can see that while there is variance, there's no long-term trend that could explain the pronounced warming. And also most especially, you know, the warmest years on record have been in the last 10 years. And for the last five years, at least, the solar radiation has been going down. So no, there's, there's no, um, you know, there's no real discussion about that, that knob right there. Uh, we, know, we know we're not getting closer to the sun. And uh, are there more greenhouse gases? Again, circling back to the very first slide I showed you, of course, there are more greenhouse gases. We have been taking carbon rich fuels out of the Earth's interior. We've been selling them to people. They've been burning them. And that reaction releases CO2. Uh, may As I interrupt again? Sure. People ask, is, will the, is the uh, cycle going to cool again? And by how much? Would you know? So we, this, we would be getting cooler right now. If we're talking about the ice age cycle, we should be getting cooler. Um, what does that mean? That means if the earth's natural climate trend was to be getting cooler and we were going into the little ice age right before the industrial revolution, then that might imply that the warming we observed is an underestimate of the real warming we have caused because some of it is being canceled by a natural cooling. So our orbit relative to the sun is taking us into a direction very slowly that would have less radiation received at the poles, not more. If you remember how intense the warming was at high latitudes in that video I showed you. Part of that is because as you get warm, you have less snow and ice, it's less reflective, and so more solar radiation is received. So there's a number of very strong positive feedbacks in the high latitude regions that are accelerating the warming in those regions. And so, you know, that reflectivity knob is being, is being also turned to a more positive uh, being cranked up as the earth warms because of greenhouse gases. 
So that's a positive feedback system. And, you know, again, I'm not going to show you videos of, of Arctic ice cover, but you can find them online. I mean, the, the decrease in Arctic ice cover over the last 30 years is just, well, from a climate scientist perspective and a geologist who thinks on long time scales, I'm comfortable saying it's shocking how fast it's decreasing. Okay. So I talk, I, you know, let's go down to this X axis, this age axis again, um, and say the curve that I, the video I just showed you of mean global temperatures is now collapsed into this one black curve. So this is about a one degree warming in mean global sur surface temperature um, over the last 140 years. Is that anomalous relative to long time scales? This is exactly the kind of work we do at Lamont. We, we use tree rings, we use ice cores, we use coral records to reconstruct long time scale trends so we can see if what's happening now is unusual. And again, very clearly, what we are seeing now has no precedent in the 2000 years that has come before. And for people who've been tuned into the climate debates uh, over the past two decades, this, this would be the equivalent of what people discusses a hockey stick curve. Uh, I'd like to interrupt. Somebody asked, how much does methane in its current amounts compare with carbon dioxide and what are, what are its effects? Um, so methane's a much more powerful greenhouse gas, but it's also measured in parts per billion, uh, not parts per million. Um, but the thing that's, uh, methane is, um, is a strong greenhouse gas. The, the thing, the reason people don't worry about methane as much as CO2 is because methane has a very short lifetime in the atmosphere, measured on like less than a decade. So if you were able to cap the methane leaks, for instance, at wellheads, um, you know, you could, it, it be, it's a very easy solve of that problem. CO2, when it goes into the atmosphere, stays in the atmosphere for centuries. Hmm. So people tend to focus more on the problem of reducing CO2 emissions because that's what's, that's what's building up in the atmosphere and warming the planet. Um, but they are both important greenhouse gases that are considered in all climate modeling and, and policy discussions. So uh, nowhere on the planet is um, it warming faster than at the poles. And um, I, I'll start this again. So connecting the dots, I would ask, okay, planet warming, CO2 increasing, planet warming, are the ice sheets melting? And this is starting to make connect the dots towards my ultimate goal, which is sea level. So there are many ways we can measure the ice amount, the ice balance, ice mass at poles at the poles. And this is just one, this is using satellites to measure the, gravita the gravitational attraction of the ice sheet to the satellite, which is a function of the ice sheet's mass. And um, this is satellite data from 2004 to 2013. And anywhere it's red, the ice sheet is losing mass. And anywhere it's blue, the ice sheet is gaining mass. So there are places in the coldest part of Antarctica, um, especially on this Northeast coast where as it warms, there's actually more snow and ice accumulating because there's more precipitation. But on the whole, there is a net mass loss of ice in Antarctica. Okay. So no, and this is same is true for Greenland. So if the ice is melting, we should be seeing it in the oceans, right? So let's think about the oceans for a minute. How do we measure the oceans? We use tide gauges. That's kind of a very, uh, standard old school way to measure how much water is in the ocean. Uh, here's some classic old tide gauges over here. This picture on the lower right is, is an electronic tide gauge um, in the back of our field station at the end of the pier in Piermont. And, um, and on the bottom here, I'm showing you the number of tide gauges over the past, what, I don't know, what is this, 140 years roughly? Um, and you can see uh, most of the tide gauges are in the northern hemisphere, that's red, and it's much smaller number in the southern hemisphere. 
And uh, obviously at the end of World War II would have been a great time to invest in tide gauges. Uh, so these are where all the tide gauges of the world are, are. So what do they show? Here's two different, in red and in blue are two different scientists, scientific studies of what sea level, how sea level has changed since 1880, 1870, based on tide gauges. Um, and what I show in this little bit of black up here is satellite measurements of sea level, which is how we do it now. Uh, well, we do it both ways still. And so I hope what you can see from this is as you go further back in time, the errors are larger, there's fewer tide gauges, uh, you know, they're further apart. As you come towards the present, uh, the error bars go down, there's much more robust network. Two completely independent studies are in quite good agreement with each other. And again, also in quite good agreement with the satellite data. So what does it show? It shows that there's been a sea level rise of 20 centimeters on average around the globe, which is about eight inches over the same time period that the CO2 has gone up, that the, the earth has been warming and that the ice sheets have been losing mass. And this is the physical evidence of both the ice sheets losing mass and also the thermal expansion of the ocean, which has also been absorbing heat along with the land. So we know sea level is rising and that the rate is accelerating. At the battery, the sea level rise has been uh, one foot over this time period. So, oh, I just put this picture in. This is, this is the road out to the pier in Piermont, which was regularly flooding on high tide. They, they've since raised the road by a foot and a half. Um, so here's the interval I just showed you with the tide gauge data in this little blue square at the end, the last 140 years, so to speak. And again, just putting it in a geologic context. And in this case, this is a reconstruction from Alan Kemp's group, looking at what sea level on the North Carolina shoreline has done over the last 2000 years. And again, you see natural variability and then this very pronounced hockey stick rise, you know, at the same time that the CO2 is going up. So it all fits together. Uh, you may ask how they did this study. You can go into marshes and at different levels in the marsh, you know, low marsh, high marsh, mid marsh, different types of microorganisms, in this case, foraminifera, live at different eco, different, um, ecological niches within a marsh. And so you can take a core and reconstruct the, the where sea level was in the past. This is one of our students going <laughs> launching a canoe in the Piermont Marsh. Okay, so what do I know for sure? Climate is changing naturally all the time. Okay, and Small variations in incoming solar radiation due to subtle movements of our planet around the sun can cause very dramatic changes in climate and subtle changes and not so subtle changes in greenhouse gases can also change climate dramatically, both over geologic time and today. We are observing that in, you know, if I just connect all these dots, this whole story hangs together. There's no prediction you can make that, you set that about what CO2 would do that you don't go and look at the data. And yes, you observe that. So from all of this, I would say you can't escape the conclusion that the activities of more than 7 billion people are warming Earth's climate. If you look at uh, emissions right now, China is the biggest emitter, followed by the United States. Um, all these little nations over on the left and then the whole rest of the world. Um, if you look at all the CO2, the 30% increase in CO2 that's happened in the last 120 years and ask where most of that came from, we would be the biggest emitter. Because remember I told you when you put it in, it stays there for a long time. So given that we were the largest emitter of CO2 over most of the 20th century, we own most of the CO2 that's in the atmosphere right now. Although China's, uh, <laughs> China's, China's the biggest emitter now, you know, annually. Okay, so 
I, I just want to talk for a few minutes about um, sea level rise. Uh, it's the major subject of research in my lab. We, we are asking the questions, how much will the sea rise over the coming decades? How fast will they rise? How will this rise vary regionally? And how will communities best respond? And obviously this is a topic that I can barely do any justice to in, in a few minutes. So, but I just want to give you a sense of the kind of work we do and, and what it tells us and, and, and why I think this work is so important. If all of Greenland melted, oops, let me just go back one second. If all of Greenland melted right here, sea, uh, at, oceans could rise by 24 feet. If all of West Antarctica melted, which is melting quite rapidly now, as you saw in that video, sea level could rise by 21 feet and East Antarctica has 170 feet of sea level equivalent in it. Okay, so we spent a lot of time in the field. We try to reconstruct sea level in the past. A lot of this is just mapping uh, um, ancient shorelines. This is the Ningaloo Reef that you can see off in the distance in Northwest Australia. And we are standing on a fossil reef that formed uh, about uh, 125,000 years ago. And this is what a fossil reef looks like. I mean, you, any one of you could walk out in the field with us and you go, oh my God, that's like a fossil coral reef. That's like so obvious. <laughs> and here's another amazing outcrop we found where there were fossil oysters with fossil barnacles on the oysters. So you know when you find an outcrop like this in the field that you were standing where sea level used to be, okay? Here's another beautiful spot. We've been doing a lot of work in the Bahamas lately. Um, this is a fossil coral reef, and this is a beach, a fossil beach on top of it. And you may be asking, how do you know that's a fossil beach? And I'll show you something very cool here. You know how when you're walking along in the, in the top swash zone and the waves come up and they push the air down into the sand and then the waves roll back out and all that air comes bubbling back up and you may see these really characteristic little vugs in the sand. Here's, here's a fossilized version of that right here. And not only that, you can look at these little vugs in cross section and you can see it right here, the little escape holes for the air. So when you see something like this in the field and you're you know, a geologist, this kind of geologist, you're like, oh my God, this is, this is where sea level was at this place at this time. So just to give you a little insight into where that takes you, here's 3 million years ago. This is prior to the ice ages starting. So over 3 million years, see, we're on our way to our 50 million year period where it was quite warm. Uh, CO2 was about 400 parts per million, which is essentially what it is well, today, it's 414. Globally, temperatures were two to three degrees Celsius warmer than pre-industrial values. And this fall line where you see all these different uh, surveyed colors, dots, this is where the shoreline was. And you know, I could take you to outcrops along this line and show you beautiful fossil shells of cobogs and mussels and scallops. And so that, that's where the shoreline was back then. Closer to home and closer to in time, uh, 125,000 years ago was the last time it was as warm as today. The intervening time period was, was the ice age, the last most recent ice age. If you go, if you go to Miami, um, and, and on the left here is a Landsat map of Miami. In the middle is a map called a bare earth LIDAR. And basically it's an elevation map where all the trees and buildings have been taken off, okay? So this is the land elevation. And what you can probably see is this really nice ridge coming along. And it's about five meters elevation behind that ridge. Much of Miami is just, you know, within a meter or two of sea level. And you can see these really interesting um, channels through this ridge. And if I was to, you know, tell you what the sediments here are exactly analogous to the sediments in the Bahamas. This is the northern tip of Eleuthera. And these are tidal channels through subtidal sands. And that's exactly what these are. These are all submarine uh, 
uh, outcrops. Uh, so these are marine sediments. That's not land-based sediments, marine sediment. And so this was 125,000 years ago and sea level was completely covered the entire Southern part of Florida. Um, so the question is why, why was it warmer? Um, and it was warmer because of the earth's precession tilted the earth, the, the earth slightly more towards the sun at that time. And so globally temperatures were one to two degrees Celsius warmer than pre-industrial. And that was enough to melt enough ice to basically cover Miami. So more than nine feet higher at that time. So where does this leave us? What happens at the poles doesn't stay at the poles and sea level rise is already a problem. So every coastline around the world is gonna have a very unique challenge. Uh, this is New Jersey in the aftermath of Superstorm Sandy. When you have a storm surge and the whole ocean is a foot higher, that storm surge is gonna be that much more devastating than it would have been a hundred years ago. Here's uh, Male, the capital of the Maldives is just one of hundreds of small islands, nations, and, and, and communities that are literally at risk of going underwater if projections for sea level rise uh, in the next hundred years come to pass. And we'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. Here's Miami. Miami has a unique problem because the rocks under Miami are so porous, the water comes up through the ground. Like the building a wall isn't even an option for them. And of course, we all know Venice, which has been <laughs> trying unsuccessfully for decades to keep the water out of its city. Um, okay, so what are other implications of even modest small rises in sea level? Probably the one that is most impactful other than the storm surges right now on people's quality of life in coastal communities is nuisance flooding. I showed you the picture of the nuisance flooding in Piermont. I'm sure you've, you know, I'm sure many of you have friends if they live in coastal communities that have talked about this. What's shown on the left is uh, on this axis on the, on the bottom is time from the 1950 to 2010. And then these are NOAA tide gauges in all these different states. And what is shown in red is the number of days per year that there has been nuisance flooding. And again, you can see the increasing rise of sea level and the increasing rate at which sea level has rised. That rise in sea level also means what used to be a hundred year storm in terms of its devastation and impact is becoming ever more frequent. And you can see places where what used the devastation that used to happen one every, once every hundred years is now happening even every one to two years. And this is what will happen with an additional foot of sea level rise, okay? So where do we expect to go? Here's the proxy records I showed you, the little forams, here's the tide gauge data, here's the satellite data for sea level rise. And now we're going into the future and where are we gonna go? There's a big range here. It could be as small as a foot, possibly manageable, lots of nuisance flooding, but you know, manageable. Or it could be up to four to six feet higher sea level rise, which for me is hard to even imagine. I think in, in that scenario, you would have to have a lot of coastal retreat, uh, managed retreat from shorelines, abandonment of communities um, on coastlines around the world. So how do we know where we're gonna go on this? Well, the biggest variable is what we decide to do as, as a global community. And I have this little thing written over here, RCP 2.6 and RCP 8.5. This is, um, these, are, these are codes for different representative concentration pathways. So when scientists study the future, they all agree to say, okay, Let's, let's, you know, if I'm gonna use my model to predict how sea level is gonna be in 2100, we should agree to put the same CO2 forcing in so we can, you know, isolate what's the response of the model. Um, in a low, in, in a low, here, let me show you, sorry, let me just go on. 
So here's RCP 2.6, here's RCP 8.5. So this was the one foot of sea level rise. This was the, you know, more than four feet of sea level rise. Sorry, this is a little out of focus. I didn't realize that until I made it big. This is emission of fossil fuels. So gigatons of carbon per year. Here's the historical emissions going along up to 2020. And as you can see, this, the, what we've actually been doing has been tracking this red line. This is also sometimes called the business as usual line. So we are tracking at this very high rate of emissions. And that is what's going to lead to the very high rates of warming, the very high rates of polar ice cap melting, the very high rates of sea level rise. On the other hand, this blue curve is a representative concentration pathway that if followed with emissions would take us down, be decreasing emissions every year and ultimately get us to the point where uh, we have negative emissions. So we're taking more CO2 out of the atmosphere than we're putting in. This little black line right here is the emission pledges from the Paris Agreement. Um, so, and this is why this, this curve, this blue curve, this is why you have the entire scientific community and a large part of um, NGO community saying, that the time is running out to make a decision about reducing emissions. Right now we're on this trend right here. You know, that's probably gonna have some sea level rise intermediate between one, one foot and four to six feet. So the decisions we make now are gonna matter to where we end up. And the reason is, is because each time you increase emissions, more of that CO2 is staying in the atmosphere. It's gonna take longer to get it out of the atmosphere, that you really need to start radically transitioning away from carbon emissions. Okay, so I'm gonna stop there for a second. And just before, um, this is where I used to always stop my talks. And, um, and then I'd always get the same, I mean, I didn't stop it right there, but basically at about this, you know, some, somewhere around here with the science. And I'd always get, the very first questions I would get is like, this is terrible, what can I do? Um, and so I thought I should add um, more or, or people would ask, you know, is this depressing? Is this, how, you know, how do you deal with all of this? And so I started adding a few more slides to my talk that, that I'll show you right now. And, but I really want to um, just kind of frame it up that this problem is so big. I, I, I call it an all hands on deck problem. Like I can share what I tell people when they say, what can I do? But it's really important that everybody realize no one person can solve this problem. It's only gonna be solved by a combination of individuals and communities and governments and business, the economic community. And ironically, I would say in our nation right now, probably the government's like lagging the most on, on making really, um, kind of solid movements towards recognizing that this is a problem and trying to solve it. So, but still, what can you do as individuals? I tell people, remember your friend Bev, and Bev for me stands for buy, educate, vote. Fundamentally, carbon emissions is consumption. Uh, we want everybody to have a quality of life, uh, we want everybody to have education, shelter, food, all of these things. Um, but there's a lot of talk about your carbon footprint. There's many easy things you can do to lower your carbon footprint and to think about. And the, one of the ways I always think about it is, is we have the power of the purse. If we're offered two options, we can choose to buy, make decisions that have an impact on the earth. And so, you know, I will just say buy thoughtfully, buy sustainably. The more we do that, the more choices and the more the market will respond to that. Be conscious of your energy, food and transportation choices. Those are the three largest parts of people's carbon footprints. Um, of food, for instance, this is a pet project of mine is eating less beef. Uh, we've written a number of papers on this with, with an extended research group. Um, beef is like 
90% of carbon emissions from our food system come from beef and, and beef farming. So uh, I have a friend, Hope Jaron, who just wrote a book that came out earlier this year. That's absolutely lovely lyrical book um, that I'm happy to plug on her behalf um, that talks about uh, climate change and the story of more. Um, educate, there's so many amazing stories about progress and successes that we have made in addressing climate change and moving towards a more sustainable carbon-free economy. I'll just show you a few that have captured my attention. I love this one. I love the irony of this one. Texas City opts for 100% renewable energy to save cash, not the planet. <laughs> um, Costa Rica is on its track to being almost 100% renewable energy. I think it's at 98%. There actually is one carbon neutral country in the world. And we could talk later if someone knows what that, can guess what country that is. It's also one of the happiest countries in the world. Um, there are amazing technologies that can take CO2 out of the atmosphere. This particular one is a study that was done at Lamont and Columbia University where CO2 is captured from the atmosphere and injected into hot geothermal wells where it's turned into stone and permanently sequestered. People, especially youth all over the world are trying to sue their governments for the right to a stable climate. Uh, they're trying to use the courts to say, look, you can't do this to us. <laughs> Essentially, that's what they're doing. You can't do this to us and to our children and to our grandchildren. And I'm sure I'm not the only one that's thinking about my children and my grandchildren as well. Um, there are, this is, this is the office building of the American Geophysical Union, my professional society. It's the first complete carbon neutral building office building in Washington, DC. And it was a retrofit of a 20 year old um, office building. So, you know, I figure if the AGU can do this with our <laughs> $150 annual dues um, from, from a bunch of geeky geophysicists and geo geologists, then anybody should be able to do this. Um, and here is a plot of Columbia University uh, had a goal of 35% reduction in absolute emissions in 2020 versus 2006. We met that goal at like Columbia in 2017. And now they're working on the new set of sustainable goals for our next, next targets for CO2 emissions. Finally, I think the thing that gives me the most um, hope is to see the activism of the youth uh, and how much they care about their future as they, as, as they should. Um, the, this is Kai and Clara. These are grad students um, at Lamont. This is Laura. She's now a professor at Vassar. Um, and this is obviously last year because nobody's wearing masks, um, but they are all passionately care about this subject. And I will also say that here's Greta Thunberg who has been extraordinary in inspiring youth activism around the world. So, the last thing I said, Bev, buy, educate, vote. Here's vote, vote for the change you wanna see in the world. I personally feel like a huge weight was lifted off my shoulders last week. Um, you know, with speaking as a scientist, the past administration was extraordinarily um, regressive in its attitudes towards climate science and indeed much science. So um, I'm hoping for more constructive and positive approaches to solving this problem as we go forward. So I'll end there. I'll thank you for listening and I'm happy to answer questions for as long as people wanna ask them if I can. Okay, yes, we do have many questions. So I'll start off. Um, China, uh, when you were talking about emissions from China, one, pa one person asks, aren't they connected to what we buy from China? How has that worked into the data? Yeah, I, I, I'm so glad that you said that, Susan, because you know people say, yeah, but what about China? But what about China? It's their fault. And it's like, yeah, I, think I can probably look around my desk right now and find like five things made from China. China's making this stuff for the rest of the world, including us. So, you know, China, I, I think it's, you know, we are all in this together. 
And, uh, and you know, same thing with all the emissions of moving all the stuff in, you know, on ships around the world. You know, the, we all have to take ownership of, of, of these emissions. Okay, um, if we control carbon dioxide, when would we normally have to be concerned about gravitational change? Um, I'm not sure what you mean by gravitational change. The it, CO2 in the atmosphere is not changing like the center the gravity of the earth. I don't know. I, I'm, I don't understand the question, I'm sorry. Okay, and then someone else commented, Amos Nachom, Nachom, an environmentalist and photographer of the ocean animals, mentioned that the cause of the global warming problems and mentioned the cause of the uh, global warming problems and one not easy to control is overpopulation of the earth and the consequential increase of industrialization, both of food production and energy expense of maintaining the world population. What are your thoughts on this? Yeah, that I mean, so I guess the question is, is the world's population going to increase indefinitely or will it level off? Um, there's a really interesting book called Drawdown that talks about all the different ways that you can uh, attack the problem of CO2 emissions. And one of the one of the ways, one of the one of the most effective ways is to educate girls and make family planning uh, methods available. But mostly it's to educate girls. If you at communities where girls are educated, uh, they, um, the population growth decreases. Oh, that's interesting. Yep. That's very, what initiatives can students support in academic institutions that lack an infrastructure in environmental education? Oh, that's interesting. Um, wow, it's, it, it, it's, I mean, I would say advocate for, for classes in, in environmental education. I mean, right now, Columbia University is in the process of establishing a climate school, a school for climate, like with a, you know, analogous to like the School of Public Health or the Journalism School or the Law School. Even going into, you know, the highest growth sector in terms of jobs right now is is in in business is people that can talk, understand sustainability as it relates to uh, business practices within companies. Um, so I would say that I, that that you should advocate for this. This is really a critical area of the future that people that students should be educated in. Right. Uh, one person said there's a hashtag, there's a, a site, hashtag stop shopping. Yeah. That would be the way to go. <laughs> um, you know, it is. <laughs> I have to say, you know, I've been shopping in my closet almost all year now with COVID. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't run out of clothes yet. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it, you know, it, it really is. It's a mindset. It's like unlimited consumption. It's being thoughtful. You know, I know personally, I have been on a journey for a long while. Uh, you know, I haven't eaten beef in years now. Uh, I'm not a vegetarian yet, but I have a feeling I'm gonna get there too. Um, uh, you know, clothing, you know, you can buy smaller numbers of higher quality items. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of decisions you make every day about what you buy and how you consume. And then there's just, you know, it, it, then there's just like resources in general. And I really admire people like, um, uh, who, who, who's, who's, who's the Microsoft guy? <laughs> What's his name? Um, you know, oh, Bill Gates. Oh, Bill Gates, right. How could you forget Bill Gates? Right, Bill Gates and, um, and you know, people that are just realizing they have more than they need and they can give that money away and it can do great, great, you know, work in the world. And um, Jeff Bezos just gave uh, a vast amount of money, he just gave 10, 100 million donations to 10 NGOs to help fight climate change. And, you know, donations like that just 
can fundamentally change what you can do as an organization. I mean, it's extraordinary. Um, so, you know, I, I think it's wonderful the people that, that, are, that are engaging and, and realizing that they can make a real impact and a real difference. Um, another question, will the oceans begin to release the carbon stored the carbo goes down in the atmosphere? I'm not sure of that word. Yeah, so the, the ocean and the atmosphere, I, I don't see, oh yeah, if carbon goes down, the, the ocean and the atmosphere, they're always gonna wanna be in equilibrium with each other. So it's true, it, 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 you know, if you start taking it out of the atmosphere, the, some of it's gonna degas out of the ocean into the atmosphere, which, you know, just means you gotta take it out longer. I don't know the exact details of that, but that's definitely something that scientists at Lamont are studying. Where will coastal population, in, in, I'm sorry. Fact, sorry, it just reminded me, like the CO2 emissions, so there's kind of a nice natural experience experiment going on right now because emissions have decreased because of COVID. And so, you know, they might, so there people are like literally trying to uh, get, you know, funding in place to go out and measure that air sea exchange and seeing if they can see any impact of the fact that the CO2 emissions have gone down with the air sea exchange. Well, that's kind of a positive COVID, the first one I heard. Um, where will coastal populations relocate? And how will, should the US plan to deal with this? Well, I mean, they, these are incredibly important questions. And, you know, one of the reasons that we're starting the climate school at Columbia is because these are some questions that go far beyond the science now, right? These are questions that involve the law school. These are questions that involve um, just public health policy, uh, political policy. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, the problem of coastal refugees and especially island nation refugees is going to make the refugee problem in Syria look like tiny. Uh, and, and people are already thinking about this and already worrying about this. I mean, there is going to be such a cascade of global problems that are just, they're in the pipeline and people need to wake up and realize that we need to deal with this now because it's not going to get any better. It's going to snowball. And, you know, there, you know, again, there's so much, so many people that just don't believe this. They think it's like malarkey or something, but people need to start paying attention to this and connecting the dots for themselves and thinking about what the implications for their children is and, and their children's children. And for the world as large, how, what do we want our planet to look like in 50 years? I agree. Um, and so the two questions sort of uh, you offered a challenge, which is the carbon neutral uh, nation. And we had um, an answer. Somebody said Bhutan. Yes, that is. So that's, it. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. And somebody, the last question is, sorry for the off topic question. Can you tell us about your gorgeous tapestry? Oh, yes, I'd be happy to. It's a Zuzani from central Turkey. So it's, it's a hand embroidered, um, basically bedspread. <laughs> Beautiful. Well, thank you so much, Maureen. Um, we've all learned something. We thought we knew it all, but I guess we haven't. There's just so much um, information and everything you said you backed up by data, which is, is wonderful to see because we always believe in this science. So it was a wonderful... Um, it was wonderful to see those graphs and um, even the, the uh, cartoon type videos that, that it explained a lot. Yeah. So thank you all for coming. Um, lots of thank yous coming in from all the attendees. And I thank everybody. And I hope you will all attend the library programs. Thank Goodbye, you. Bye, so everyone. Bye.